Good morning, everybody. Well, <laughs> morning, morning. Uh, welcome to today's meeting of the Suffolk Public Sector Leaders. I'm Councillor Susie Morley, the leader of Mid Suffolk Council, and I will be opening the meeting today. The meeting is being broadcast live and is available to watch on the Suffolk County Council's website whilst we're in public session. We've received apologies from CJ Green, and we have uh, Chris with us. Oh, there he is. Yeah. Uh, welcome, Chris. Um, we've got Ed. Um, Tracy Bleakley has sent her apologies, and um, Councillor John Griffiths for West Suffolk has sent his apologies, and we have with us Councillor Sarah Broughton, who's the deputy leader. So, welcome, welcome everybody. Um, before moving on to the agenda, I'd just like to take the opportunity to make a couple of um, chairs announcements. As you may be aware, in the November autumn statement, the Chancellor announced that Suffolk was the first county area to complete a devolution deal under the devolution framework. And while we await the publication of the Suffolk devolution deal, I'd like to invite Councillor Matthew Hicks to... Um, make any comments you'd like to make. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you. Thanks, Susie. And obviously, I'm very delighted to update leaders as much as I can on the uh, completion of Suffolk's devolution deal, which was highlighted by the Chancellor um, in his autumn statement on the 17th of November. Um, this is absolutely a historic deal for Suffolk, uh, and we are the first county in the country to get a devolution deal of this type. Uh, it's a significant step forward. Uh, and it delivers on our long-held ambitions uh, to have more control over our future. Uh, currently, I am actually unable to reveal the details because Suffolk's devolution deal uh, uh, is under embargo until the actual signing. Um, but I can confirm that the funding and the powers and the flexibilities will be similar to those that we have seen printed clearly in Level 3 devolution framework. Uh, that was published in the Leveling Up White Paper earlier this year. So this means that Suffolk will be one of the first counties to benefit from a new model of devolution with a long-term investment fund, with an agreed annual allocation, and tools that will allow us to deliver more for our communities, including increased control over transport, infrastructure, and skills. Of course, the deal will only be taken forward if it has to go through a clear process uh, of consultation and ultimately through full council, and it will be a county council decision. I think we need to be really clear that a level three deal uh, is ambitious. Uh, no powers are being transferred between districts and the county, and there's no unnecessarily, unnecessary upheaval. There's no change to the police and crime commissioner or the authority of the police and crime commissioner and importantly, there's no new layers of institutional bureaucracy being set up. So I look forward to being able to give you more information once the uh, signing, official signing takes place. But this is something we've had ambitions for together for Suffolk, and I'm really pleased that we've been able to deliver it. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Um, I'd also like to take this opportunity to recognise that this is the last SPSL meeting that Stephen Baker, the Chief Executive of East Suffolk, and Russell Williams, the Chief Executive of Ipswich Borough Council, will be attending before leaving their current roles. Um, so on behalf of all of us leaders, I would really like to thank Stephen and, and Russell for their contributions and support to the SPSL family over the years and to wish them the best in their endeavours. <laughs> does, does any other leader wish to comment? Or? Praise, praise our retiring chief execs? Um, well, um, if, if I may, of course, it would be... It'd be <laughs> would be remiss of me not to. Um, so, you know, I mean, it's, 
you have some great chief execs, you know, uh, and you work with some great leaders at the time. And, and Russell, no, and, and Stephen um, has, uh, <laughs> has, has absolutely, um, you know, been pivotal. And I think, you know, in respect of the Suffolk Public Sector Leaders Forum, of course, you know, we, we know that, that this couldn't work without the combined brain effort um, of, of all of our, our chief execs um, coming together that uh, actually uh, try to find those compromises when leaders don't always see them, when, uh, when uh, absolutely come together to give us some clarity about what we can and what we can't do, um, and uh, more often than not find ways um, to support our ambitions. And I know Stephen has been, has been key in that. Um, so. Uh, he will be sorely missed, I'm sure. Well, he'll definitely be missed at East Suffolk Council, but I know he'll be missed as well through uh, his, his wisdom over many, 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 many years of uh, public service um, that he brings to Suffolk public sector leaders as well. So, thank you. Thank you. As, as, a, as a leader, you get used to following the advice of your chief executive, and my chief executive has advised me not to say a great deal, so I will, <laughs> I, I will follow uh, that. I'll ju just echo what has been said uh, about Steve. I've known Steve uh, for a long time. He was uh, originally an officer at Ipswich Borough Council when I, when I first became a councillor, so all good things come out of Ipswich. Uh, I think we can, we can, ag we can agree on that. Um, but um, you know everything that Steve has said uh, uh, that, uh, about Steve, um, I'd, I'd echo that with with Russell. You know he's given me a huge amount of um, support, um, fantastic advice over the years, and we've got a great deal done. Uh, and I know that he's worked well with other chief executives. Um, uh, throughout throughout Suffolk to make sure, and we've gone through quite a few changes uh, over the years. We've managed to keep that going, and it is those personal relationships that we've that we've all built built up that enable us to work together in the way that we do in Suffolk uh, and achieve things um, that um, that you know other other areas, other counties perhaps aren't able to do. So, um, so I'd like to put on record my thanks to Russell as well. Sorry, Councillor Hicks. I just, I just like to add, really. I, I know we don't all go around the room saying the same thing, but actually, um, what was interesting is both Russell and Stephen were both on their laptops, looking very embarrassed, you know, not looking up as both Stephen and David were speaking. But the Suffolk system works well because we come together, and we may have our differences, but we always try and find a way through it, and that works at a political level, but also a chief exec level. Uh, so I think that is our strength. So I really just want to thank you both for playing your part in what you know, has brought forward a strong Suffolk working together principle. You know, that's the way we work, it works well, and you're a large part of that as well, so just thank you. Lovely, thank you very much everybody. Um, I'm now gonna hand over to Caroline to confirm any actions arising from the notes of the last meeting. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just to confirm there's no um, outstanding actions, uh, the budget report you'll see that we, we come to at the end of the agenda has been amended to um, reflect the decision that leaders took to invest in the warmer homes proposal. Um, other than that, uh, happy to take any questions, but no outstanding actions. Uh, can we agree the notes with a show of hands, please? Thank you very much. Our next item is the annual review of the international trade managers and I'd like to welcome Michael Chapman and Koyas Mia, international trade managers who are hosted in the Suffolk Chamber of Commerce. In November 2020 leaders agreed a three years of funding to invest in developing Suffolk's trade offer uh, including creating the, these two posts and since then leaders have received annual updates reviewing the previous year's activity and highlighting the next year's priorities. We're now drawing to the end of year two of that three-year funding, and so I'd like to invite Michael and Koyas to introduce this year's annual update to leaders. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, it's great to actually be here rather than on a virtual um, event. So we are, as Chair said, the international trade managers. Uh, we are, are not... Uh, 
a sort of uh, an image of uh, John Dugmore we do actually exist. So I say it is good to actually be here um, in, in reality. We're going to give you a brief um, update on our um, work for this year and looking ahead to our forward plan for next year. Um, I will just give a very brief introduction, pass over to Coas, he'll do a couple of slides and then I'll come back at the end just to sort of finish off on the work that I've been, I've been doing. So hopefully we'll keep it all pretty um, straightforward and simple. Um, so, quick introduction. Well, why are we really here? Um, what's the need? Well, it's firstly, it's just to recognise that international trade is an important driver for local economic growth. So it's therefore key to our local growth agenda. We know, and the businesses that we've been talking to, that businesses that trade tend to be more productive, more innovative, and more resilient, and of course, tend to pay higher wages, which in terms of the cost of living crisis, I think is important moving forward. Our approach has been one um, of being working collectively with our growth partners, and we are really keen to focus upon the, how we can improve suffer trader performance and to exploit new market opportunities as they arise. So our aims are fairly straightforward. We support the growth and wider resilience of the Suffolk economy. We are there to assist um, businesses navigate the future relationship with Europe. Previously, we were Brexit advisors, but you know, it's a bigger world now. Brexit has been completed, but there are still challenges and teething issues, to say the least. And also, we're looking at opportunities to maximise um, you know, growth from international trade. Our focus is predominantly to actually champion Suffolk as a place to do business, invest and trade. We're working on sort of crafting a robust Suffolk trade policy. And what I mean by that is that we're learning by doing. You know, we came into this post as, as, as Brexit advisors. We've moved on to take a much more wider international global perspective. We are learning by doing, and hence we can report back each year on you know, what, what lessons have come forward from our engagement with both growth partners and, and from businesses. We provide free, impartial advice, guidance and support to businesses of any size, of any sector. You know, we don't mind, we will talk to, to anyone who's got a, a, a trade question, and they do. Our activity is, is focused upon strategic policy work, trade promotion, business engagement, and working across the chamber to improve products and services which can help all Suffolk businesses achieve those goals. I'll now hand over to Coyas, who will then continue on with the presentation. Right, thanks, Mike. Um, so we have been engaging with Suffolk businesses on trade inquiries, um, so some of which have been quite low level, others have been more detailed. Um, inquiries are coming from far and wide in Suffolk, um, from different sectors and different sized businesses. Um, this has allowed us to build uh, a data set of 400 businesses uh, in Suffolk that are trading globally, um, who, which we now communicate regularly with. Um, so in terms of case studies, um, they have been very diverse, uh, such as working with a timber firm that came across challenges uh, with the uh, Russian sanctions. Um, we have helped the business to identify and connect with key contacts in the global market, um, which could um, see them setting up a, a sawmill and then create um, be one of the key sort of suppliers in the UK, uh, in the domestic market, and create more job opportunities. So some of the, uh, the trade promotion activities uh, include relaunching the Suffolk Chamber International Trade Hub that offers more guidance and support for businesses. It looks at three key areas, uh, which are trade facilitation, trade promotion, and trade policy. International trade training courses unlock trade potential in getting businesses export ready um, and boost business performance regardless of the size of the company. ASEAN is seen as a thriving market for food and drink, so we're working closely with overseas chambers, partners and government agencies um, to promote Suffolk trade. International Trade Group is a forum for Suffolk businesses to share best practices, support and receive guidance and encouragement to develop their own trading activities, as well as hearing from local and national policy leaders and thought leaders. Suffolk Global Business Network consists of British Chamber of Commerce and business groups located across the world, as well as local overseas partners, government agencies and embassies that drive two-way commerce and business between the location um, and Suffolk to identify opportunities for Suffolk businesses and to promote Suffolk trade. An international trade newsletter 
uh, it informs Suffolk businesses on how to navigate future trade with the EU, help seek out global opportunities, as well as highlight relevant events and uh, training available for local businesses. So going forward, uh, we would like to build on the areas that I've just mentioned, um, as well as introduce professional services of international accounting and legal um, and insurance to fully support international traders on their export, uh, sorry, international trade journey. Um, Suffolk Chambers Trade Survey found that 59% of Suffolk businesses would like to trade with the Asian market. So a cluster webinar on trading with Asia will give Suffolk businesses a better understanding and opportunities available and how they can be explored. I would like to engage with the Suffolk SMEs to better understand the key challenges and the barriers when uh, trading internationally, the intel then to be shared um, with the local MPs, feeding to uh, British Chamber of Commerce policy as well as the Growth Board, um, and then provide tailored training courses, market analysts, and route to market for businesses um, that are importing or exporting for the very first time. This will give businesses the information and guidance to better understand the process as well as provide confidence when it comes to trading internationally. I'll pass it to Mike to go through the final slides. Thanks, Coyce. Um, so that's the sort of trade promotion angle. I'm just going to mention a little bit more on the sort of the trade policy side of things. Um, so really, the, this year um, has been, I probably would sort of say, it has been challenging, but the, the range of sort of inquiries and referrals that we're getting um, have been, as Coyce mentioned before, very diverse. Um, and certainly, from looking at how we improve access to European markets and global markets, some of the things that we have been coming up against, of course, has been the sanctions policy because of the war in Ukraine, um, but also issues such as labour mobility. So there's, there's, been, there's been quite an issue regarding accessing um, European markets for temporary workers. So we've I've been doing a lot of work on that side, so addressing sort of technical barriers. So these will be regulations, so getting products into Brazil, China, have been also um, a bit of a challenge. Um, as I said, there's key to our approach is actually working collaboratively with our, with, our, with our partners. So I've been doing that. So we've been providing a sort of a trade um, sort of input site, line of sight on, on key policy decisions like levelling up county deal, environment, UK share prosperity fund, you know, Transport East because that takes in our ports. Um, the annual business survey, of course, which has been very important, visitor economy. I need a little bit more detail actually just being invited to actually then sort of, you know, not just basically comment, but actually rolling up your sleeves and, and doing some work. So we, we've sort of been contributing onto the um, A14 trade investment corridor work, county deal, and also just another example was scaling this diverseness of, of things that we get asked to do and, and, and help is working at RAF Milton Hall with the, with the US Air Force. Um, looking at employment, um, because you've got US nationals who are there who can actually now, in the context of what we're seeing with potential free trade agreements and whatever, and basically more um, trade with the US is, is a potential, you know, uh, mine of expertise and knowledge. So that's just uh, an example. Um, working on green trade, so working actually to sort of bring together both Suffolk's sort of environmental um, priorities, plus with how you can actually be linked in with trade. Um, and then looking at Suffolk's International Gateway, um, I hosted a meeting with the sort of Deputy Trade Commissioner for China and Hong Kong with representatives from shipping and logistics firms because of the importance of the Port of Felixstowe, China um, container route. The forward plan for next year is very much, you know, doing the, doing the same thing as this year, but maybe a bit sort of deeper and broader. Um, I think I can't really probably stress more how important this business intelligence that we, we, we get. And we give you a little sort of a snippet with these, with these sort of case studies. Um, but bringing this awareness, um, I think actually will probably help all, um, all our public you know, sector um, colleagues. And just to give you an, um, another example, yesterday um, I was talking about the, we're hearing reports that lorry drivers are parking up on the A14. There's been a lot of theft of petrol so again, this is sort of an issue that again, it's something we don't want, want it to be raised, we want to see how it's addressed. If it does become a major issue, then we need to escalate it up. But this is an, an, a wider sort of debate about facilities for, for drivers in Suffolk. That links to the competitiveness of the Port of Felix, though it links to the A14 corridor. So that's just an idea of those types of issues of bringing them all together and escalating and rising them if they do become serious. 
Um, so that in reflect, reflects the second point I'm making about sort of working with our, with our growth partners um, and looking at how we can actually draw upon you know, some, some of these opportunities that will be coming in the future. Again, with Suffolk's International Gateway, um, there I think it's, again, we have got some commitment from, from um, the embassy in Beijing to potentially continue this dialogue which hopefully that will, that will happen in, in, 20, in 2023, um, but also that could be expanded to, to other areas or other key ports, maybe in such, you know, Kuala Lumpur, whatever, um, moving forward. Green trade, um, just come on the back of the first um, workshop on the green economy. So again, this is actually putting trade in green trade in the context of the wider green economy for Suffolk. What are the opportunities there? And moving that forward, we have got another second workshop coming up in end of March, where I'll be sort of presenting a potential roadmap. I think there's a lot of opportunities that we could um, focus on in relation to green trade. And then developing, um, as I say, a sort of robust trade policy. Um, and one of, I said, this is all about learning by doing. And one of the, the key takeaways I've, I've had from this year has been, the, the, a sense, this diversity but also it's how we link all these things up because I just thought, thought, oh, a trade policy will just be about exporting. It's not because there are links to, for instance, the visitor economy, what we're doing in innovation, um, ex um, foreign students. So when you actually see it in a wider internationalization approach, there are potentially more opportunities and gains to be made. So again, this is just sort of, you know, taking on the sort of perspective that we have from a global perspective on that global position and then potentially presenting that in, um, in, a, in a different way for, for the public sector. And that's really you know, where we are and what we've been doing. Um, and it's really just inviting for any comments or questions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, and thank you. Uh, it's, it's useful to get that update. Of course, you know, I, I think you rightly identify. You know, this this is about trade coming in and going out. It's about it's about movement um, between us and and not just Europe, but but the rest of the world as well. So I'm I'm just wondering how engaged you are with the, with with the Freeport structure. So Freeport East, um, you know, a number of us are obviously in, engaged in that and and on the board. I just wondered whether you've had sort of early meetings with the, with the chair and. Uh, and, and chief exec that have been appointed to Freeport East, and um, and also um, just whether whether you're um, able to have any engagement and influence uh, around uh, the, the the targeted operating model stuff around around imports and uh, and because that again is going to have a significant um, impact and uh, uh, on the on the way that uh, that goods are flowing uh, both ways really um, across from Europe. So. Just those would be my two questions. Thank you. Um, great, thank you. Um, Freeport East, we are aware, um, but I wouldn't say we're, we're engaged. We do get the, the, the information um, because we are working you know, with, with our partners, so we do, get, we do get that type of information. But I know, um, oh, I've just forgotten the name of the chief exec, um, Bill Peter. Stephen Bill, he's had a meeting with Suffolk Chamber, so we are sort of in, in the loop. But maybe moving forward, that's something, because I think they're still, I mean, I think their, their business model was at Treasury yesterday. So I think hopefully once they've got that through, then a bit of clear water, then maybe. But there are potential opportunities. I know Freeport East will be, you know, because it is a split site with, with Harwich and, and Port Felix, though. So, yeah, there are things I think we could potentially contribute in the longer term. Saying that, you know, because, you know, there are other people who are probably better qualified than us to actually be doing that work at the, at Freeport. But what have been doing, of course, is actually working more at the, the port level. So I do a lot of work with the Phillipstoke Port Users Association. I'm also tied in with the Port Health Authority. And that comes into the target operating model, which has been delayed and pushed back and pushed back. There are some concerns. Um, the reading that I'm getting that the government might be putting something out before Christmas, but they've been there before and we've been delayed before, so it might not come out. But I I'm just sort of reading tea leaves, but with a number of different statements coming out from ministers and the commitment to try to resolve the Northern Ireland Protocol by the spring, 
And I don't know if you've picked it up, but the government constantly now says it's all about digital products, digitalization. I think that we're on a cusp. So whether we do get something before Christmas would be good to see some granular detail, um, but we might probably might get probably pushed into the, to the new year. Um, I think it has been creating some uncertainty for some traders, and certainly for the importers, it's been fine from Europe because there's nothing. My key concern with all of this, which has been great, you don't want to overly burden you know, importers, but there is a differential. Exporters are having to do the full checks. Um, and I, you know, so there's part of the level playing field, but I can see why it's been done. But my concern is on the biosecurity front, because although we do have checks for international goods, if the EU goods are coming through, you know, everyone said, well, yeah, but we were part of the EU. But yeah, now there's that fraudulent behavior that something is coming in, food product that's not being checked. We don't want to go back and have another you know, crisis. So I think it's definitely needed to create some certainty. And there are some um, companies in Felixstowe, certainly food importers, who are worried about this and have been. And so I've been trying to escalate that up and working with, with, with partners like Port Health to answer some of those questions. So hopefully that's a roundabout way of saying thank you. You, you mentioned Harwich and Felix, though, but of course Gateway 14 is also in that mix. Are you able to advise um, organisations on the benefits of moving to a Freeport site in terms of um, tax benefits and all, all that sort of thing? Um, yes but maybe not in as much detail as we would like, um, because some of the tax implications, some of the, the custom, we're probably more, re more relevant for us is on the custom side mm -hmm. rather than on the tax side. Um, so yes, we do do that. Um, so certainly from the, say, from those custom, customs perspective. Um, but again, I think once the business, full business plan has been developed and then produced, we can, you know, we can use that. We, I don't think we haven't, off the top of my head, had that many inquiries um, about companies wanting to move into Gateway 14. I think there are others who've got that sort of covered. We do escalate. If we do see something, we escalate. And of course, we do work with, you know, Baber and Mid-Tuffer, Mid you know, um, at dev teams, you know, so there is that. So I know I was on a meeting with Michelle Gordon yesterday, so yeah, that, that information is being, you know, transferred. Tim. Oh, that one works, right. Oh, okay. okay, right. Um, one of the things that I think is quite significant, expanding the international trade links, which I absolutely agree with, I think we've got huge potential. How would you prioritise that? You can't obviously have an initiative for all 230-odd economies all at once. What sort of framework will be used to do that? And obviously, it needs to be flexible. Just wonder if you've got any comments on that. Yeah. I'll probably answer first, and of course, we'll then chip in because the, you know, it's important. Um, I think that's one of that's one of the key challenges is trying to work out how you prioritise. But it's a challenge because of the, the strength of the Suffolk economy, because we've got a large number of SMEs. So we're an SME-based economy, which is very diverse. We're not dominated by particular sectors, big sectors like pharma or cars. So those, you know, who are dealing with sort of, you know, Japanese car manufacturing, getting it back into to Europe, then of course Brexit has been a major challenge and Rules of Orange is a major challenge. Those things don't really affect Suffolk as much. Um, we do have some very, very good um, exporters, but as I said, they are right across the piece. So it makes it very difficult to target. However, saying that, we do know that Europe is still the biggest market for, um, for, for some traders, but there also there are opportunities coming up. Um, the US is another market, but that doesn't, you know, that's a big market for the whole of the UK economy. It's also for the Suffolk economy. But I think looking forward, I don't like to sort of say, let's throw the baby out with the bathwater, because as these opportunities come up, um, there will be potential ways in which we can connect businesses who don't realise the opportunities, for instance, of the new FTA that could be coming up with Israel, which might be coming soon. We've just had a, a mutual recognition agreement in Switzerland, which is very important for the service economy. But those things don't necessarily trickle down to the Suffolk economy. But 
try to answer your question more directly, Europe, US, Asia, China, that Indo-Pacific, which will also include sort of the um, Australia, New Zealand, that's the sort of the data that we're seeing. Um, again, from the annual survey, the um, Southern Economy Annual Survey, I think the running order was, yeah, Europe, America, then Australia, then Asia. So that's the, that's the sort of the, some of the key areas, but we don't like to ignore the rest, but that priority will probably, more attention will be put onto those. So then, of course, wants to, on your. So, so um, as, as Mike Swag identified, because we've got a diverse sector, um, it, it's, it's hard to gauge where to kind of concentrate on, but um, with our um, trade group that we've set up, um, that gives us, we've had last, the last one that we set up, which is the very first one, sorry, we've had about 40, 40 odd businesses there. Now, we can hold these regularly, um, so they'll be three times a year, but within that, that group, it would then give us more uh, information from businesses and, and an idea in terms of where the markets are that they would like to look at, what are the kind of key concerns, what are the barriers. Um, so that would then refine the way that we, we can work and then start targeting certain areas or certain, certain sectors. Um, at the moment, it's a little bit more difficult because we're getting, any inquiries that we're getting are from diverse sectors um, as well as different sized businesses. Um, we see from the surveys that Asian market is, is one that um, is, is liked from the um, Suffolk point of view, uh, and that's why I would like to hold the, um, the webinars around Asian market and see uh, the interest that, that we get from, from businesses, which indicated by the survey, 59% of businesses have an interest in that market, um, which will be then helped by the agreement if we can get the membership for the CTPP. Um, that will really encourage the, the trade between so, Suffolk uh, and, and, and the cluster. Um, so I hope that, that kind of answers the question. Can I can I see just one other follow-up to that. So presumably you'll be able to come back here if there are things that we at public sector leaders could unblock or if there are things in the way. Obviously we don't have a magic wand, as I often say, um, but if there are things that we need to press on to in order that development and economic growth to come, then um, you will come back and let us know. We'll have to see what we can do about it, but that's not a promise. We can look at it, but, um, but I think things like that are really, really important. If we, we want to make Freeport a, a, a big success, there are other sectors as well. Um, so we need that sort of dialogue. What can we do um, to actually loosen things up and make sure that we are successful? Because we already are, and we want to be even more successful. Thanks. Sorry, just very quickly, yeah, I'm completely 100% behind that. And I should have said before, it's what we're trying to do is, 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 is business intelligence and data gathering for the Suffolk economy. We know what the priorities are from the UK. We know, but by monitoring markets, and understanding trade flows and how they impact upon the Suffolk economy I think is really, really important because we do have that diverse, you know, and what we're looking at is that we don't want to just cherry pick the top ones. I mean, DIT do that anyway, so we don't want to be in conflict with them, but there is potentially underneath that a sort of a rump of really good pragmatic SMEs who could actually potentially do more. They're doing a really good job. They just need maybe some confidence building, some assistance, some targeting, and by sort of putting down the foundations, which, which is sort of data-led, evidence-led, policy-led, is actually to say, look, these are those opportunities that are out there, and potentially identifying, like you say, to actually sort of building, building success, which I think is really important. That's what I don't think we want to be overly committed, because one of the key issues, is, of course, is geopolitical change. I mean, we don't know what China might do. So, yeah, we are targeting Asia and looking at that ASEAN market, but something could happen, like with, with the war in Ukraine. I wouldn't have predicted that was given you know, last time. So we have to be nimble as well. So we have to shift those markets around. So yeah, it's a hell of a lot of work, but I um, but appreciate the offer. Chris. Thanks. Um, so uh, as, as a let, we've been massively supportive of this program since the, since the start. It's really something, a point of difference for Suffolk that is doing better than other parts of the country and being more innovative. Um, to put in context, the, um, the trade advisors are obviously part of the kind of business support landscape anchored by the EDOs uh, in our districts and the growth hub across, across Suffolk as a whole, providing that core support. Uh, and then 
uh, the trade advisors provide that kind of specialist specialist advice, uh, obviously around trade advice, and there are other specialist um, advises that, uh, advice uh, networks that, that are also run across accounting fast growth programs, innovation networks, manufacturing networks, they're all part of the kind of system, and it's probably worth at some point bringing a, a kind of map for, for, for leaders to see, perhaps, um, in, in the future, just to see how it all knits together, because um, it is quite well integrated. Uh, and it's worth, it's worth also saying that while the government talks a lot about exporting, um, they've been re withdrawing the amount of uh, boots on the ground in terms of DIT support in the area. So it's much more of a self-service online service, which is why it's great that we have in Suffolk individuals who can speak to businesses. And you can see from the case studies the, the, the real impact that's been had. The question I had really for uh, for you two is uh, is around that the, the question was do we do we like your forward plan for 22 23 yes we do um, there is though a kind of a bit of a, uh, a question mark about how much time you'll be spending on policy uh, and how much on actual delivery and it's always a it's always a dilemma because you want to get stuck in and helping shape policy but actually uh, there are businesses who need help on the ground and aren't fundamentally that's the service that was funded. So just interested in how much how much you're going to balance that time with uh, with dealing with businesses on the ground and uh, and doing all the other uh, all the other excellent stuff. Great, um, great question. Thanks, Chris. Um, it's probably in the sense that we we are reactive to the demand. So, for instance, when we first started, it was probably crisis management because the companies were phoning us up and meeting, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, that tailed off as we started to go through transition and I think as Paul's mentioned in looking at the case study, what we are probably more focused on is not quantity but quality. So what we want to do is to help businesses come through that, that journey um, and that still doesn't mean to say that we do have you know, um, questions which could be answered in one email. But I would say that the, the type of engagement now would be talking maybe three to four weeks. It might be a luxury, but I think to actually to create success, and yeah, and we can go through the evidence in relation to, to, to DRTs and the export support service, and yeah, that has actually been now brought in house, the contract's gone, and et cetera, et cetera. So I think that's been a novel, but I think the point there, they're all, you know, we do get referrals from, from other, you know, from, from the EDOs, from the Growth Hub, but also what we then also provide is that basic, also that policy intelligence, is that coming back to actually sort of say, because they're not necessarily looking at that, we are. So that puts us in a very strong position that we're doing both. The priority is always the business engagement, um, and we manage that in the sense that it, it's not a, an either or. It's if, if the business demand is there, then the business demand is there, and they are the priority. Um, it just means you can become very nimble on your feet when, you do, when you're talking about the policy side. But, um, but we don't underestimate the importance of, of the policy because those policy questions, which I also think there's a, there is a bit of an, I think all the EDOs and all the others might need to have a refresher course on actually understanding where we are in relation to, to sort of post Brexit trade, etc. Because, you know, when you don't get that full answer from one department, DIT, that does majority in exporting, but there's all the others, you know, DEFRA, DCMS, and also if you're not even talking about data transfer, all that type of issue. Um, so the, the, there's, there's that element, but also the policy questions and the regulatory issues are the ones that we directly talk to with businesses. That is the answer, because they are some, so, you know, understanding the import registration processes in China means the fact that you know, just dealt with another company yesterday about how they can get their food products into China. So with, again, without that policy background and understanding, we wouldn't be able to, we would then just move them on to another. And that's what businesses get really, really frustrated about. No one will actually sit down and even tell them, say, sorry, I don't understand or I don't have, let me go away and try and sort it out for you, rather than just sort of saying, Oh, go and look at the government website. That's what they get really frustrated. But, sorry. Any more questions for Michael or Coyers? So, um, 
Our lead is happy to support the work plan outlined for the year three. Have a show of hands. Excellent. Thank you very much, Michael and Coyas. You're very welcome to stay, but equally feel free to escape. Thank you. Moving on now to, we've got a, a progress update on the National Literacy Trust. And I'd like to welcome Adrian Orr, uh, Assistant Director of Education, Skills and Learning, and also Jason Vick from the National Literacy Trust. And they're going to provide an update on the work to uh, get Suffolk reading following our investment last May into year two, two of the program. Welcome, Adrian and Jason. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you very much for the invitation, colleagues. Um, we're delighted to, to, to come and tell you about the progress um, of this really important project. We think there's some exciting things happening, um, and it'd be, it's really good to be able to share that with you. What we'd like to do is um, take you through a presentation. We're not going to go through every line on it, but give you some highlights from it. Um, there's two or three uh, little bits we want to add at the end and then give you ample time to ask us some questions. I'm sure you'll, you'll, you'll want to delve into some of the things that we say. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Jason, who's going to take us through the presentation. Thanks very much, uh, Adrian, and very good morning, everybody. Thank you for uh, your time today. Um, so in terms of the update, we have now begun what is a 10-year partnership journey uh, called Get Suffolk Reading. This is a uh, broad ambition within the campaign to improve literacy levels, but not for the purpose of education in and of itself, but because we know that literacy affects well-being, life expectancy, uh, and aspiration. In fact, the, the item that we've just most recently had talking about the mixed economy of Suffolk and the fact that uh, SMEs play such a pivotal role in the economy actually speaks to the importance of literacy. One of the interesting things about SMEs, of course, is that they are more likely to recruit locally. They are more likely to want to seek talent near home rather than having a national recruitment strategy where they're going to pull people in from outside. So actually that speaks to the importance of building aspiration and skills within the economy, and we're happy to play our part within that. Um, what is on screen that you almost certainly can't see, because frankly I'm struggling and I've got it nearer to me, um, is a brief outline of kind of the 10-year commitment that we have within this. But straightforward, what we did uh, in terms of the process was identify the range of needs and challenges which families and communities were facing in terms of parental knowledge and engagement. We know that literacy starts before birth, it happens in the home, and what parents know and have experienced themselves and what they then do is absolutely critical. The best teachers in the world only have children in the classroom for a limited period of time, and attitudes and behaviours are shaped by families and communities. So our work is about working with families and communities in support of those broader outcomes. We want to build aspiration and working with partners like Suffolk Mind, also look at mental well-being and the role that literacy plays in uh, supporting everybody in terms of having the uh, good mental health that they need in life. So what you've got there is um, the plan. We're looking at a county-wide campaign which we are delivering and then three particular focus areas in Haverhill, Stone Market and Lower Stoft. And they were identified because they represent uh, to the great extent possible the mix of Suffolk community so that what we are doing creates learning across the board um, and I will move on now to some of the things that we have so far done. In terms of what we are delivering. We appreciate that you have uh, initially invested in two out of ten years, and we'll get on to the sustainability question, but I think it's important to draw your attention to some of the reasons that we work in the way that we do across the country as the National Literacy Trust. The evidence around literacy proven by national and international studies is that it is more impactful on long-term outcomes for children than parents' socioeconomic status. That is, if children enjoy reading when they are children. So what we are saying is that whether you want to, whether, whether your primary concern is numeracy outcomes, is examination results, is earning potential by the age of 30, is relationship stability or mental well-being, it does begin with literacy and it in, begins with enjoyment of literacy. Um, we also know that book ownership is critical and we've done a huge amount of work. Adrian will update on some of the key figures there, but actually getting books into the hands of children that won't have them. So what we are talking about is responding at multiple levels to the challenges that communities 
face and the communities that face the greatest challenges are those affected most by deprivation and poverty. So those with insecure income, those with greater reliance on benefits are the ones with the least resources and the ones whose children are likely to have the poorest outcomes and together we want to address that. In terms of some of the key updates then, we began work in one of our priority areas in October and all three areas up and running in April. So each of those areas has a locally appointed member of staff we call a hub manager. Their role is to work on the ground and the, the focus for the first uh, stage of our work has been that level of partnership engagement. So we now have around uh, 30 local businesses across those three areas helping in one way or another with in-kind support. Uh, we have quite a few hundred people who have now volunteered to become literacy champions, adding community voice, and we've also worked very hard to leverage in other programs and other funders. So what you can see there is against our priorities of well-being. We've got some key moments around Take 10 where we've had people like um, Anton Deck and Costa award-winning authors and Anthony Horowitz of its uh, involved. Uh, we've got work in the early years space as well because we know how important that is in the home and also to look at employability and skills and aspirations. So across the board those are kind of the, the foci that we have that were agreed by the various partners we've worked with, input from communities uh, and of course increasingly supporting schools as well. So we are trying to do the things that schools desperately want to do in terms of influencing the home in order to complement what they have set out to achieve. So there are some key uh, numbers on there um, which you can look at at your leisure. In terms of some of the particular numbers then, so this is just the outline reach figures that you'll see here. Um, we've got the direct delivery, so those, that first line across the top is the number of individuals who we've worked with in each of those areas. Now the key thing here is we will hit that target, but our work is about hitting people who need it most. So if it was just about reaching the numbers, you can do a big shiny event, you can invite a lot of people along and you have a lot of you know, very happy interested people who think that reading is wonderful. We actually need to work harder and smarter than that in order to reach people for whom reading literacy and books is a turn off. Um, the volunteer engagement figures we're extremely pleased with. So our definition of literacy champions here is people who have relevant lived experience, who can speak with authenticity to somebody else who might be struggling. Um, it's all well and good for myself uh, no offence to anybody in the room, but potentially any of you to come along and say reading is really important because it's probably a part of your life and your experience. For people who don't have that, we need to engage people who are a credible voice in their communities, and we've got some brilliant volunteers already. Um, books and resources, quite a few uh, tens of thousands there. Um, and also the media reach is growing and the engagement. So those are some of the key output metrics which we are measuring against. Um, and as I say, that puts us on track against what we set out when we started working together. Um, in terms of the evaluation and impact, so beyond reach, of course, reach itself isn't enough. That's easy enough to prove in some ways. What we have here is a community evaluation strand. So actually, what are people telling us is working? Um, so that is looking at the focus around aspiration and well-being and what we term the home learning environment. We're also interested in what practitioners say. So that's early years providers. We've got a lot of work with the uh, family hubs now as well, and also teachers, and looking at our literacy champions and our various partners. So there is a range of survey data uh, that will be pulled together and reported then on an annual basis. And we've also got evaluation working with school partners. So while I started at the beginning saying this isn't a, an education program in the traditional sense, we're obviously very keen on engaging schools and supporting them. Um, and we are in the process now of developing uh, a school's pledge as well as evaluation for independent programs. So things like the little big book club uh, that we've got going on, which is supported by um, HarperCollins and Chase Rewarding Futures. So the Chase program around library makeover, 17 primary schools have already had a library makeover. Um, that program comes in at a value of about £170,000, funded by JP Morgan Chase. And I'm happy to let you know now that 10 more schools will get that program in the coming year as well. So that is a combination of professional development and training, books, physical materials and resources. So immediately we can already point to 270,000 of value leveraged in against the investment which you have made uh, just from that program alone. And that really speaks to what we want to achieve in terms of resources where they're needed most, support for professionals and also opportunities to engage families. We wanted to briefly draw your attention to data which I'm sure you'll be 
aware of, which is the, the free school meal pattern in Suffolk. So looking at the five-year trend data, what we've got is a year-on-year -year upward trend across the three priority areas in Suffolk as a whole. So what we're seeing is that there's a 10.8 percentage point increase for Suffolk in terms of the number of families who are entitled to free school meals. So that is the number of families, predominantly those on low and very low income. The reason that this matters uh, to us and the work that we're trying to do together is that deprivation, when families experience deprivation, priorities have to change. When families do not have enough money and they are facing barriers, whether it is the most acute ones with the current cost of living uh, costs or simply the ongoing need of, of feeding and supporting families, it is very often the case that parents and carers will be time poor as well and will not be in a position to prioritise ongoing education and without support and help. So what this picture tells us is that actually in the communities where we're working, the need to have free, accessible and enjoyable offers that continue to support and promote literacy and learning in the home is actually more important even than when we started because what we want to make sure is that the increasing levels of poverty don't leave another generation behind. And in terms of our plans going forward, because that's nearly enough doom and gloom, um, we are pushing forward with our Love Reading events and activities. So this is the kind of collective programme that builds on that enjoyment of reading that is so important of book choice and book ownership. We are developing an early years toolkit, so that's to support practitioners both in uh, the private and voluntary and also uh, in any maintained sectors. We want to carry on working with businesses. So, of course, we've already got support from, as I say, around 30 across those three areas. But there is a really important role and voice for business in supporting aspiration and in supporting this kind of work. Uh, the school's pledge is being worked on now with school leaders. Um, and the aim for that is to support schools to be those voices out into the community as well as what they offer within the school. Um, we're going to carry on with our Literacy Champion Drive. We're already over the original target we set, so we've simply increased that target and we will carry on recruiting more because we think that volunteers add real important value. And I already mentioned the Chase Rewarding Future, so that's the primary school library makeover program which we are bringing in. I'm going to do a couple of quick highlights and then uh, hand over for some questions. So here's just a very quick case study of uh, a lower stoffed pilot that we've got. Um, so this is all about engaging families with reading, building parental confidence uh, and of course book ownership. And what we've got there is just some key stats about really positive feedback um, from families in terms of increases in their enjoyment of reading, increases in reading frequency, um, children reading more often and children choosing their own books. These are all the things that we want to see because these are positive behaviours that build into reading more often, developing stronger literacy skills, doing better in school and building the kind of aspiration and skills uh, and life that young people want. So that's the kind of uh, feedback that we're looking at at community level and that programme is now being developed and rolled out across the other three areas. Um, and just to give you a quick sense of prioritisation as well. So I mentioned right at the outset that reaching uh, families and communities in need was more important than just reaching everybody. So here is a quick snapshot with the Indice of Multiple Deprivation map. Um, darkest areas are those in greatest need. So here what you've got with the two larger stars is uh, Roman Hill Primary School where we've been running sessions and a leisure centre where we're running programmes. And then all of the little red dots are where we've got other activities. So community book drop swaps and exchanges. So this really is about making literacy as accessible as possible where people are, not expecting them to come to us. And this kind of underpins the ethos of our approach, which says that we want to offer things to people who need them the most, but that means we need to go where they are because we can't expect them simply to come to us. Um, there is a video. I'm not sure it's worth the risk of trying to run it, he says, looking around at anybody who thinks about tech support. So I suggest that maybe we leave that, but I, I recommend that you do have a look at it. It's only a, a couple of minutes, um, but it is just really direct and honest feedback from, from kids um, and parents. So in terms of the last bit before we go to um, questions then, Adrian, did you want to come in on some of the resources and then I've got a couple of other stat updates not on the report and then we'll go to questions. Thanks Jason. Can people hear me? Yeah, just, just one last thing. Thinking about 
further concrete examples of the impact of your investment. And I'm, I'm going to do a bit of show and tell. I'm a school teacher by profession, so bear with me for a few moments. I asked a child in a school recently um, their favourite book, um, and um, they, 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 they chose this one. Um, it's Kipling. Um, other great authors are available. We know, and you will know, I am certain, you will have a, you'll have a favourite book from childhood. You'll have a, you'll have a favourite book that you've shared with um, members of your family, with your children, if you have children. That isn't an experience that all young people get. Books are not part of some um, children's lives. And one of the greatest impacts um, that we've seen in the first year, and to be frank, I didn't think we would see at this level, I thought it would be year two or year three, is there's 45,000 books in the hands of children that probably would have not got them not that their families don't care, but purchasing a book might not have been a priority. And certainly in the current economic climate where families are making tough choices, as Jason said, purchasing a book, the average cost of a, ch of a children's book is £7.99. There'll be a lot of families that can't do that. So in the first year, another added value is £300,000 worth of books not paid for out of the money that you've given us, brought in through the partnership with NLT. And it's important I share that because you've got to see what you're getting in terms of value. However, the value is much greater than that because we know that book ownership is linked to engage, engaging in reading. And we know engaging in reading develops that love of reading. We know that that then links to all sorts of other um, advantages. I think when I first came to talk to you, some of, some of you will remember that, some of you might not, um, one of the statistics I shared was that the single biggest indicator of somebody's economic independence and stability at 30 is their reading age at 11. This project is making inroads into some of the families that, to be frank, the schools and wider education system aren't because we're not getting to them early enough. Um, so I'll stop there because I, don't, I, I know you'll have questions um, to ask, but hopefully that's a helpful update and uh, we'll field questions. Thank you. And for the record, my favourite book as a child was The Water Babies. <laughs> it's Steve. Um, thank you. Uh, yeah, a re really good um, presentation, thank you, and, it, and it's really good and really positive to see the work that, that is being done and the, and the impact that's being having. Uh, and, you know, it, it makes me incredibly proud that Suffolk public sector leaders are, are part of that journey, which takes me to my point, really, which is I see no indication that Suffolk public sector leaders is part of that journey. Um, on any of your material or your or the websites or, or anything else. It refers solely um, to Suffolk County Council who are a fantastic organisation um, and are, are very generous in their funding of many things. Um, but you know even on, on Suffolk Infolink, which I appreciate is not your is not yours, but it says um, uh, get Suffolk Reading is a project funded by Suffolk County Council and delivered by the National Literary Trust. So, I mean, I think it's important that, that, that we, as an, as an organisation, are acknowledged somewhere, um, not because I want everyone to go, oh, aren't you great, but that gives an indication to other organisations that the sort of role that Suffolk Public Sector can lead um, in, in supporting them as well. So that would, that would be my, my question. Well, it's not really a question, it's an ask um, that there is some acknowledgement of that somewhere. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I, I wonder if I'd just come back on that for a moment. I think it's a very fair point. I think some of the... Um, um, we need to review what it says um, on those public-facing sites. What I would say is that every opportunity that myself, NLT, and my team, um, when we're telling people about this, when we're going out, I am very clear. This is Suffolk, Suffolk County Council and Suffolk public sector leaders, and Suffolk public sector leaders have given the lion's share. I will ensure that that's better represented in the, uh, in, the, in the online material. But thank you for that. And same commitment, of course, from National Literacy Trust materials. Thank you. Ed. 
Um, thank you. This is brilliant work. R really impressive to see the progress. Um, my question is around mental health. So, um, Adrian, you'll know there's fantastic work in Suffolk now around providing support to schools around mental health. And I'm wondering whether we're making the links between this work and the support work we're putting into the schools, because obviously lit literacy is a huge, um, you know, a huge enabler for good well-being and mental health, isn't it? If, 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 we completely agree. Thank you. Thank you for, for raising that. Um, indeed, when we established the Pathfinder Group, Suffolk Mind were one of the first partners, and they are significantly involved in supporting and advising us. And we're linking in with other um, other statutory um, providers, um, so those links are, are, are well well embedded. And if I just add to that briefly, so it, it is one of the um, things that's been discussed around the school's pledge as well. Um, so we've worked previously, National Literacy Trust has worked with place to be who are a specialist uh, provider for mental health for young people through schools. We have materials that we've co-developed with them which will form uh, a part of the pledge and we've also got an ongoing commitment um, around what we call Take 10, so two points in the year around World Mental Health Day and Mental Health Awareness Week where we pull together things like um, advice reading lists, authors who speak about mental well-being and the role that it can play. So. Uh, it's advice and support and information as far as possible, and then obviously the programmatic side gets built in as well, but it is, uh, it is very important to our work. Tim. Uh, thanks, Susie. Um, I agree with what Steve said about the publicity. I'm sure Brad over there is scribbling this all down, so we'll hand that one over to him. Um, now, I think it's a fantastic project, and I have to say, I was, when I looked at the papers, I was shocked at your evidence base to see the difference in life expect expectancy for illiteracy of 26 years for a boy and was it 20 years for a girl? I mean, that is absolutely shocking. It's almost shameful, if you see what I mean, how we have, as a society, allowed that to develop. Um, so this is why it's really, really important. And it reminded me of when I went to see, um, I think it was Warren Hill Prison, where we sponsored a small project to get prisoners to read who were in their 40s and 50s. It was like being back at... Um, at school when you're about six or seven years old, all sitting around in a circle, reading sentence by sentence collectively. And there were tears in these guys' eyes, and I'm, this is not me trying to blow smoke anywhere. They said, you know, that's never happened to us before, ever, in their life. And um, this is the first time anyone's just come to listen. I couldn't believe it. And um, so one of the reasons I w wanted to ask this question is because it, it's great, brilliant, and absolutely 110% behind it, is there, or maybe I've misunderstood this, how would you actually reach out to, for example, some of the really, really deprived areas who perhaps don't go to school? Um, and I'm thinking of some of the organisations, the voluntary and charitable sector, like Inspire Suffolk, the Porch Project, or whoever it happens to be. Um, how would you get them? And of course, the other area, which is particularly relevant for us, is those who are unfortunately tangled up in the youth offending service. There will be those there who really have virtually no literary skills. And you may not be able to do that all now, I absolutely get that, but would there be a possibility or is that something you would be able to look at as the uh, project progresses? Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think just immediately, obviously, the point is that we have focused our resources in one, one place while we get established and while we get working. In terms of the broad question, though, we have um, an entire programme working with the criminal justice sector. So my opposite number, Rebecca Perry, is head of adult literacy for us. Um, we work across the majority of prisons across the whole of the UK with a programme called Books Unlocked. Um, and we also have work with YOI's Youth Offending Institutes. Um, so we do have that to bring. And as far as I know, that would be funded to work in any um, setting in, in, in Suffolk, so from that side of things. In terms of the wider reach into other organisations, the way that we would normally prefer to work is as we are established and developed um, in an area where we're getting to obviously in Suffolk, what we can then do is start to widen that partnership network where our expertise can be of use and where we can then, for example, COVID and leverage funds in. So um, in some of our other hubs, for example, we may not have a priority around particular groups, but that doesn't mean that we can't then work with partners and organisations that do. So yes, this is absolutely the sort of thing for both our strategic steering group and for yourselves to keep on our agenda uh, for us to build in work. Um, we are starting where we're starting, but that doesn't mean it's where we want to stop because we know the problem is, is much bigger than that.
much indeed. It's a, a fabulous program, and I'm really proud to be involved with it. So thank you for coming and talking to us about that. Um, leaders, when would you like to see the next update on this? Six months? A year? Six months? Okay. Lovely. Thank you. We'll look forward to seeing you soon then. Thank you. Again, you're very welcome to stay, but feel free to leave if you wish. Thank you. So uh, now moving on to the Suffolk Climate Change Environment and Energy Board update uh, and the proposal for the release of funding. I'd like to welcome Jill Corwin, who's the Executive Director at West Suffolk Council and also Chair of the Officer Suffolk Climate Change Environment and Energy Board. And Jill's going to pre present a progress update on delivery of the Suffolk Climate Emergency Plan and also outline a request for further drawdown against funding that we've already previously earmarked um, in June last year. Thank you very much, Jill. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Very good to be here this morning. Um, first of all, if I can just offer apologies from Councillor Andy Drummond, who chairs our portfolio holders group for the environment. Um, he had hoped to be here to present this himself, but wasn't able to, so he had asked me to stand in. Um, as um, Councillor Morley has said, this is an update in terms of progress to date um, and a request for the drawdown of the remainder of the funding. Um, so I've got a few slides that I will go through with you. You have had a paper which goes into far more detail, so I won't repeat everything that is on there, um, but very happy to take any questions on it. So in terms of our highlights, um, one of the things that we have set up is actually a dashboard which is updated as soon as we've got publicly available data sets to put on there. And it covers a number of the indicators that are important to us in regard to climate change across Suffolk. Um, that can be accessed by members of the public. It's on the Suffolk Observatory. There is a lag in data, in nationally reported data, which is a challenge, but at least there we have a repository that is showing our progress and our commitment across Suffolk. In terms of tracking our update against delivering on the climate emergency plan, we have, um, in, internally we're tracking that through the board, but we've got the first of a publicly available newsletter that we've shared in a link to the paper, and there's just an extract there on the, side, on the slide, that we want to be pushing out on the Green Suffolk website, sharing amongst our networks, in order to show the commitment and the work that's ongoing. One of the consistent bits of feedback that we get is actually that people don't realise how much we are doing collectively as the public sector to address this issue. So we've got lots of good stories to share. In terms of um, the finance that you have already allocated to this, um, from the one and a half million, we've already drawn down um, 621,000. So there on the slide now is just some updates in terms of how some of that has been spent. Um, communication is a really important element of this. We know that 67% of change is down to behavioral change. We've delivered the low impact living project um, and those resources are still available on the Green Suffolk website and actually those statistics there are already out of date in terms of visits to the website because it's constantly being used as a point of reference. We've launched the um, Climate Emergency Crowdfunder, so this was a match funding scheme whereby community groups were able to apply for funding to support them in initiatives they wanted to develop. We uh, are working with five communities already, we've um, already had two applications approved and we've got a number in the pipeline where we've just had some very initial inquiries. Again, positive feedback on that is that that offer of match funding is then enabling communities to seek the rest of the funding that they need. Um, we're 100% spent in terms of our VCS organisations audit service, so this is where we're supporting organisations to actually audit their operations and buildings. Um, we've actually used the Suffolk Climate Change Partnership Community Advice Service to support some of those organisations um, that weren't able to take advantage of that. Really important in order to help them on their carbon reduction journey, but also in terms of building efficiency, re-energy costs. Homeowners support service, um, we have, um, we've let a contract to actually um, support us in getting information around different house architect archetypes 
in order that people can access information about what they can do about their buildings. But I think what's really interesting is the work we're doing to try and set up a network of community champions. So people within their communities who are trained to support neighbours, other people around understanding the action that they can take in terms of their homes, but also their lifestyles as well. Um, so that work is just starting off. The Net Zero Knowledge Hub, um, that's launched. You've got a link to that there. That's for businesses, and we're already supporting some businesses through that. Again, a piece of feedback we have on that is there is so much information out there. It's been helpful to have something that has been brought together for Suffolk where they can actually access information that's local and relevant and, and has the backup of people they can talk to as well. And then finally on there, the, the District Heat Network study, um, that was a separate request that came to you earlier this year. We've got, um, the consultants have just finished doing their mapping work across Suffolk. We've got a number of locations where we potentially can drive this forward. During the course of that work, government restricted the funding to actually only be available for some very large scale um, sites. Um, nevertheless, the information that we've got from the consultants will be helpful, not just for the ones which we hope we can take forward, particularly in, in Ipswich and Lower Stock, but also for some of the smaller ones that we're looking at, for example, uh, around Lake and Heath, which is a housing and school site. So that's some of the achievements in terms of the um, money already spent. So what we're asking to, for today is on the back of that is for the release of the remainder of the funding, which is actually um, 923,000. And in the next um, slides, I'll just summarize what we want to use that for. Um, again, more detail is available in the paper that was circulated to you before the meeting. Um, Clearly coordinating all of this work is no mean feat, so being able to secure the second year of funding for our programme support and our communication support, but actually using some of that for some work around the Green Suffolk website. That is becoming ever more important as our platform, and the engagement we're doing with communities is they want somewhere where they can kind of share ideas, post questions. And indeed, I know it was something that was suggested at this meeting um, a, a while ago. We haven't yet managed to put that in place because that's a, a, a fundamental shift in terms of the website capability. This will enable us to do that. We're also looking for um, a sum of money that will act to kind of top up some of those community funds. So in terms of the support that we were offering to our voluntary community organisations, that's spent. If we can top that fund up when we've got requests that come in and be, have that flexibility in order to do that, that would be really helpful. Um, against sustainable homes and cleaner power, the community energy sector is one that is increasingly important. Um, but actually really complex for communities to get into. There's a lot of feasibility work that's needed to be done in order that we can leverage through government funding, um, as well as um, being able to then network the groups, provide some templates in terms of the way that things can be approached. So there's a piece of work we've brought together around there that will support that. Low carbon transport continues to be a significant challenge for us um, in, in, in Suffolk. Of obviously due to sort of the rural nature of the community as well as um, the A14 and the transport links that we have running through it. EV charging network, incredibly important. Um, studies have shown that um, one of the concerns of people in terms of switching to electric vehicle is the availability of infrastructure. And although Suffolk performs well, and indeed we've secured um, more government funding on that recently, being able to drive that forward and accelerate that further will be something really positive. Um, and um, actually in terms of the taxes as well, making sure that we've got um, some charging points for our taxi fleets. My apologies, there's um, an error on the slides. The e-bike loan scheme has actually been withdrawn, so we're not um, progressing with that element of it. In terms of industrial and commercial energy use, really targeted support for Suffolk businesses here. What they have asked for is support around actually auditing their business. So we've got some um, capacity to do some in-depth audits with them, give them specialist reports. We've got an advice line. There's some events and webinars happening as well. And actually taking some real exemplar projects that we can fund and showcase. Because again, what we know is the ability to kind of showcase and influence others incredibly important. 
The 25 by 25, 25% reduction in carbon by emission by 2025 is a campaign that we're asking businesses to sign up to, to make that pledge that you've got real demonstrable outcomes in terms of the work that they're taking. Um, and we've already had some interest in that, which is, is, is really super. So um, that's a whistle-stop tour of the paper. Um, there's quite a lot of detail in there in terms of such a range of schemes that we have um, on offer. Um, the collaborative nature of all authorities and um, public sector partners working together on this um, has been really positive because what we have is task groups working across each of those themes who are, um, have put in an awful lot of effort to bring this together. So um, I think what I, I, whilst I sit before you this morning, I'm on behalf of all, all our organisations and, and everyone who has contributed an awful lot of work to get us to this point. Thank you very much. Much, Jill. Um, I'm just wondering, we know that um, the county council has purchased something like 10, I believe it is, infrared cameras that could be loaned out to parishes. Are you able to assist with that, to extend that scheme for parishes to have use of these infrared cameras for checking out their homes and where the heat is being lost? Yeah, that's certainly something we can look at because I understand it's been fully subscribed till April, which is fabulous news um, in terms of renting it out. So I, I will pick that up. And that's that, that flexible fund that's in there, that's 73,500. That's absolutely the sort of thing it could be used for. Steve. Yeah, thank you. Uh, a, a really useful presentation, really useful update. Thank you, and congratulations to you. And I know, as you say, the, the, the whole team that sits behind for, for the work achieved so far. Um, I think, you know, for, for me, you know, we always need to spend a lot of money and put a lot of effort into comms. Um, you know, com, comms is really important. And, uh, and, you know, generally we sort of measure, uh, we've had this many people have visited this, but what we, of course, what we need to know is what have they done when they've gone there? You know, that, that you know, how have we influenced change? How has, you know, what have, the, what have that? So that's, that's the more difficult stuff to, um, uh, to pick up. And uh, I think, you know, what, one of the things that, that, that we found locally, you know, within, within the district council is that, you know, if we can just pick one thing and ask as many people as possible to, to do X, and you know, then then you start to build, and you can start to see what that what that looks like. And, and once you've got them booked to doing X, you can move on to Y. And you can, you know, so it's about generating not just that. Oh, that's interesting. What's next? You know, oh, there's a good recipe for cake. Um, it's it's about actually making that that change, isn't it? And uh, and my my colleague James Mallon, of course, would say small change, big effect, and all that sort of stuff, wouldn't he? Because he loves those phrases. But um, <laughs> Uh, so, you know, how can we how can we be more targeted on actually the change as opposed to the the reading about the change? I don't know if that makes sense or not. It makes absolute sense, and it's a really good point. What we're trying to do is work across all the different themes. So, in terms of communications, looking at linking that then to specific things that we want to achieve, so we've got something more measurable at, at the end of it. So, for example, when we talk about householder improvements, linking that both to the warmer home scheme, linking that to other funding that we hope to be able to draw in. So we do um, an exercise. We then map that through in terms of the people that are then engaging. Now, it's never an exact science. Um, I think the, the one thing that we are doing is trying to approach this on multiple fronts, though, because thing, different things will work for different people. Um, sometimes it's the transport side of things, sometimes it's the home improvement, sometimes it's just the decisions everybody makes in, in their lives. Um, and also not be too preachy in regard to this. So the way in which we engage I think is really important. And in terms of the comms and communications group, we've got fantastic support on that from the voluntary sector, from the education sector. And one of the things we're looking at doing next year is actually an event with young people, which I think that's a great point of influence in terms of taking it back into the home as well. Thank you. Tim? Me again, thanks Susie. Good morning Jill. A um, couple of points just to raise here, uh, and I don't know how the programme would expand this. I've just been um, speaking at the county NFU AGM, and there's a lot of work going on there with farming as how to reduce the impact plus better use of scarce natural resources, which is a bit of a catchphrase of mine. And I was delighted to hear you mustn't preach to people because it won't work if you do that. 
We can't be going down the road, ban this, ban that. There have to be sensible alternatives that you get public buying. So I was really pleased with that, and I'm sure Brad's got that all written down as well. Um, but I do think engaging with the NFU and other, others, that is all part of the story. It's a huge industry if you put food and drink in with that. So I know they'd be welcome. So if you want any contact details, uh, give me a bell and I can put you in touch with people there. And the other thing I just wanted to mention, that, that last section about industrial and commercial energy use, I'm still pretty concerned that this headlong rush to electrification of vehicles, that's fine in urban areas and so on, but if you look at our huge logistics business in Suffolk, um, if you look at remote rural areas, I've mentioned agriculture, emergency services, I can't see the technology where if you have an uh, armed response vehicle loaded up with God knows what and weight and everything else and having to arrest two or three people and stick them in the boot or whatever. Um, the resilience of the vehicle. So hydrogen technology, I do think, has got a role to play, and I think that's part of Freeport East, is it not, about hydrogen East? How might that be incorporated? I know it's a difficult thing, but I think that we need to try and embrace that, one step at a time, of course. But I think, again, that could set Suffolk apart from other places. We've got the innovative capabilities. We could do pilot projects, all sorts of things. I just wondered if you are able to give that some thought, not necessarily come back now, but when you able to digest that all, because that is rather a lot. But I do think that is important. We shouldn't lose sight of things like that. Yeah. <laughs> Steve's going to answer it. Thank you very much. No, two really good points. Um, NFU were involved when we were originally uh, developing the plan. And it was interesting, because one of the, the, the conversations that we had was whether we needed a specific section on agriculture. Right. And actually, it's encompassed within industrial and commercial. But absolutely... Picking up those conversations is important, so I'm happy to have those contacts. Thank you. In terms of hydrogen, yes, um, we're linked in with Hydrogen East. Um, one of the things that we've sought to do within the plan is focus on the things that are deliverable by 2030. Um, of, um, we are conscious of, obviously, of the work that's being done with Freeport East and trying not to duplicate things. So almost if it's being done elsewhere, we don't need to scoop it up into this plan. This was where we were trying to pick up things where there were gaps, but it's definitely something we're, we're, we're keeping an eye on progress on. Thank you. May I, may I add something um, to that, uh, if I may? So um, uh, our, our district, so is, is Suffolk uh, District Council currently at the moment um, just pulling together Hydrogen Conference. Um, we, we've got a number of key, key speakers uh, signed up. Tim, I'll, I'll make sure that you get a, uh, an invite to that, but we've got three very exciting projects um, in, in East Suffolk, and I'm sure there'll, there'll be um, others as well. So, uh, you know, we, we're, we're seriously looking at that, but I'll make sure you're included, Tim. Thank you. Make sure we're all included, Steve. Um, and there will be there will be biscuits, Matthew. Um, <laughs> <unlike you. laughs> and, and Jill, I love the data dashboard. Um, I think every council should have a link to it from their website. Okay, so do leaders agree to release the uh, remaining nine hundred twenty-three thousand four hundred fifty-eight pounds? Yes. yes, and we'll have another update in six months' time. Everybody happy with that? Excellent. Thanks so, very much. Thank you ever so much, Jill. Real pleasure to have you with us. Uh, next item on the agenda is item six is the budget. Um, I'd like to invite Ian Galling to present an overview uh, of the paper. Thank you, Ian. Thanks, Chair. Uh, so this is the uh, usual paper uh, that you get that just updates you on the budget. So since you last saw this, uh, we've updated it with the 756 contribution or commitment you made to the warmer home. So that's the uh, actual contribution and then the underwriting uh, of the wider budget. Um, it makes note of the, um, that element of funding um, from the Brexit pooled funding that we uh, is uh, essentially an underspend from that area that we've agreed to utilise against uh, the district's UK shared prosperity fund allocation towards the growth hub. So we'll be playing that in uh, in the next week. Uh, and it's just interesting to note that the year one funding for the current year that the government promised us in October for UK SPF, we still haven't got. Um, so I suspect that there's quite a lot of us saying, are they going to extend the deadline for spending it as well? But that's by, by means of a linked update. Um, we'll obviously update this report following your um, decision that you've just made around uh, environment and climate change. Uh, and the final thing, so 
Jerry's Appendix 2 contains the sort of summary uh, update, uh, the brief update you get against all those funding elements uh, that SPSL has supported. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so that's the end of all the items on the agenda. Do we have any other business to discuss? Thank you very much, everybody. So the next public meeting is on the 17th of February next year. I look forward to seeing you all then. Thank you.